Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where somebody's boot got filled with molten lead. In our high school, our science teacher would always take great pride in demonstrating the thermite reaction each year for new students. It would be done in the front of the lab with a plexiglass screen in front, in a ceramic pot. He would often soup up the reaction with a special ingredient, as he called it. One year, it was a little too energetic. As soon as the magnesium ribbon hit it, the whole lot went up with a huge foomp shooting molten iron straight up through the ceiling and showering down onto the students in the front row. Yikes, that's not safe. Luckily, except for a few burn holes in trousers and the ceiling, no one was injured. He's definitely lucky that no one was injured, because sending thermite all over your students sounds like a really great way to injure people and get fired, so that is a terrible, terrible idea. When I was in kindergarten, I drank a kilo of the local equivalent to Elmer's glue, because I thought it was yogurt. And while at the time I didn't feel ill, the consequences of it have been coming with the years, having now a lot of gastric issues as an adult. <laughs> I think it goes without saying you shouldn't be drinking a kilo of glue. Uh, I've got some of these. This one's not as dangerous as a lot of the other ones on here, but it sure was dramatic. I'm a high school teacher. I'm licensed for general sciences teaching and a few other things, but at the moment I'm teaching social studies. But my classroom wasn't near the science wing. Last year, near the end of the day, there was a sudden and prolonged FWASH sound that was so loud that it made the pictures on the wall rattle before a rolling wall of dark smoke came pouring into the classroom. I luckily have an exit door near my classroom and I was already evacuating my students by the time the fire alarm went off. It turned out that the chemistry teacher down the hall was preparing a potassium nitrate plus sugar combustion demonstration for the next day, but for some reason decided to mix up one enormous batch, enough for five lab groups each period for six periods. I'm not sure how it was ignited, but once it did, the damage was done. My students were mostly fine, but a lot of others had to walk through the cloud to get out of the building and inhaled a nasty amount of smoke. One asthmatic student who wasn't allowed to grab his bag before leaving ended up having an asthma attack that wound up with him in an ambulance. I always hated that leave your all things rule for this exact reason. Public school ventilation being what it is, meant that it took hours for the smoke to clear and school ended before students were allowed to go back inside to get their things, and my classroom still smelled like burnt sugar when I left for the summer. It's just another reminder to be careful, even when you're dealing with relatively mundane chemicals. People make the dumbest mistakes when they get overconfident with safe chemistry. Yeah, this is really terrifying. I guess if you have really vital medication, it's good to keep it on your person at all times, because you don't know when an emergency is going to happen. I'm not sure whether it's better or worse to be grabbing bags when an emergency occurs, but if everybody grabs their bag, then you start having a lack of mobility in a really extreme situation. So I understand why the policy is in place, but at the same time, the student had an asthma attack that would have been avoidable if they'd had their medication on hand. As a kid, I sprayed canned air upside down in a soda can that I cut in half, then tried to ignite it in my dad's garage. I was expecting it to just, I don't know, boil off. I thought that they used inert gases in canned air. Then my eyes and lungs started to burn. I tried stomping the fire out and instead spilled the halogenated hydrocarbons that I did not know were halogenated hydrocarbons all over the concrete, prompting them to spread out, evaporate, and burn even faster. I ran out of the side door of the garage and stumbled on my way out, landing on the grass, heaving and gasping heavily for a few minutes. I didn't tell anyone. I was lucky nothing else caught on fire. I punched in the code to the outdoor garage opener later to make sure nobody else got exposed. That is so scary. <laughs> a lot of compressed cylinders have gases that, when combusted, can produce a lot of nasty fumes. One of the ones we've talked about before is difluoroethane. It'll make HF gas as it burns. So you shouldn't be burning products that aren't intended to be used to start fires. Otherwise, something terrible like this can occur. I ran a multi-kilo scale reaction a few times that used about 20 kilograms of refluxing phenol. Oh my gosh. The smell was nice until it seeps into your clothes, hair, etc., despite wearing full-body Tyvek splash suits. So I personally like the smell of phenol, but 20 kilos of phenol sounds like probably a bit too much, even for me. The butyric acid story reminds me of the ingenious construction of my former school, which was connected to another school by a small hallway. In 12th grade chemistry class, we did an esterification reaction, and my teacher thought that the best compounds to do this are butyric acid and ethanol, to show the transition from the smell of vomit to pineapple. Butyric acid stinks so bad. However, ethyl butyrate does smell great. It's a good, good smelling chemical. The reaction was done under the fume hood, Nevertheless, both schools smells like butyric acid for two weeks. As my teacher wanted to know why this happened, she did the obvious. She elected two students to smoke a cigarette under the fume hood. And guess what happened? Both schools smelled like a bunch of students were smoking. Apparently, the fume hood was connected to the school's ventilation system. I don't know if they ever fixed it. It's definitely not okay for a teacher to be telling their students to smoke just so that they could test the ventilation system. You could do that with like a burning piece of paper. You don't have to do that with tobacco cigarettes. Oh my gosh. A colleague has stakes in several foundries and can tell a lot of stories about the industry. He told me that the most dangerous metal to cast is aluminum because steel is so hot it just Leiden frosts off you. Here they're talking about the Leiden frost effect which is like the effect of water in a hot pan where it just like boils off and fizzles around. 
or liquid nitrogen off of a surface where the liquid boils at a temperature much lower than the temperature of the surface. So for liquid nitrogen, for instance, and liquid nitrogen boils at a really, really low temperature. So it just produces like a little, a little cloud of nitrogen under the droplet of liquid. And molten metal will do the same thing because it just evaporates the water in your skin and produces a little vapor cloud. But it has to be fast, otherwise you will get burned. It just light and frosts off you and you won't be hurt, but aluminum is not hot enough and sticks. He told me that every so often a worker would get burnt and that at first he wouldn't feel anything, but they start to give him pain medication right away and call the ambulance and hope that they arrive early enough to bring him to the hospital before the excruciating pain of burns starts. Tough industry, but he says workers are generally happy because they can directly see the fruit of their labor. I wouldn't recommend that anybody tests this, but I've been told that you can submerge your hand in molten lead and pull it out if you're quick enough, but I don't think it's worth testing. I'll take people's word for it. My mate bought a furnace and we decided to melt down a bunch of brass after we ran out of copper. We were confused as to what this white fluff was and why the breaker kept tripping. So yeah, I googled it and apparently it's zinc boiling out due to lack of flux. My mate got a big whiff of the zinc fumes before I could tell him. I think he kept googling and reading about zinc poisoning for the next day or two lol. Certain metals are volatile enough that they can actually boil out and the last thing you want to be breathing in is metal vapor, oh my gosh. Despite my years in a lab, the worst thing that happened to me was at home. I was going to add some chlorine pucks to the backyard pool, and the container had been sitting outside in the sun for a long time. When I opened the bucket, I was greeted by a nice yellow cloud of chlorine gas that sent me into a coughing and spitting fit for about 10 minutes, store chemicals properly. Yeah, that's awful. <laughs> pool bleach can form chlorine gas when exposed to heat and light, so you definitely should ventilate your container before working with it. During some class this year, which was the first thing in the morning, and it was also just after a party that was organized by the college, someone had to put a pipette into the pro pipetter. He held the pipette from the tip. So what would happen happened, and it broke off, and due to him forcing it in, he stabbed his hand, where he just started leaking a lot. A classmate went to the teacher with what the teacher later described as the funniest face of dread I have ever seen, to announce that he was over there leaking out from his hand after stabbing himself. Then, the teacher called the college's doctor or nurse, who said to go to the hospital, which is like one kilometer away, so it's not that bad. The teacher asked for someone to drive him there, and he ended up having some stitches and missed a tendon by like five millimeters. The cool thing was that his group for another class didn't finish an assignment that they were supposed to finish, and they got it awarded extra time since he had medical documentation to back it up. He got really unlucky, and he got really lucky at the same time. That is really terrifying. I think a pro pipetter is just one of those plastic wheel adapters for a graduated pipette. I've never heard it called that before. I would have just called it a pipetter. If you know what a pro pipetter is, let me know down below. At my last job, industrial chemist at a cosmetic slash toiletry factory, when the plant's operators were making shampoos, body washes, and other colored products, they had to weigh dyes out in the lab because their scales weren't sensitive enough. You only needed a few grams in a two-ton batch. Out of all the dyes, FD&C Blue 1 was the worst to deal with because it gives a bright, intense color at very low concentrations, and it came as very fine particles. Even opening the tub had to be done very carefully. It'd spray anything within a three-foot radius, with tiny blue specks that were invisible until they became wet. And if you had an operator who was heavy-handed with the spatula or spilled some while diluting into water, it was an absolute nightmare to clean up. The worst thing was, if you managed to get a tiny wee bit on your lab coat, then the coat would invisibly stain everything it touched. We also made semi-permanent hair dyes containing similar persistent dyes that were less soluble in water, hence harder to clean up. Basic Blue 124 and Basic Red 51 were particularly bad, but they were used at much higher levels so the operator didn't have to weigh them out in the lab. That's crazy, it's not the type of thing you normally think about. You wouldn't normally think about dyes having this sort of problem, but this kind of reminds me of that fluorescent dye story from another compilation where somebody had spilled some on their floor and spread it absolutely everywhere. So just because it's not a toxic chemical doesn't mean it isn't a total headache to clean up afterwards. Today's Yikes Awardee is W.T. Burton. I used a very old kit of ectochrome chemicals to develop E23 ectochrome. It was a huge kit for two gallons, but I only used 500 milliliters worth each time. It was all powder-based except this bottle of Color Developer Part 3, the most important part. The bottle contains formalin and benzyl alcohol. The metal screw cap on the glass bottle was hard to open, so I used my teeth. It worked fine until one time the glass neck broke, and I got a little bit of formalin in my mouth. Oh no! It tasted bitter and I washed my mouth out. I was okay. That is awful. You should not have formaldehyde anywhere near your mouth. Oh my goodness. This is today's big story. All these molten metal accident stories keep reminding me of one in an old client's battery recycling facility from many years ago. They process lead acid batteries, mostly from automobiles, so lots of vats used sulfuric acid and molten lead. For the work area where this incident happened, might have been one of the steps where dross is pulled off to be processed separately, splashes of molten lead were somewhat normal and expected. That should never be a danger to the workers, since they stand on an elevated and guardrailed platform to the side, out of the way, and use long disposable tools to interact with a melt. Yeah. No. For even more unknown reasons, they had almost all the wrong sizes of PPE on for that shift. Jacket too short, undersized leg protection, 
oversized boot covers, etc. The gloves and hood might have been correct, but it wasn't a factor. I don't think we ever figured out why they didn't wear the correct PPE, as there was plenty of their sized PPE available, and if it somehow wasn't available, that would be a valid and accepted reason not to do the shift and still get paid. My only guess is maybe laziness or not taking it seriously, slash complacency due to lack of any recent incidents. So because the jacket was too short and the leg protectors had gotten stuck on top of the oversized boot covers, that wave of molten lead went directly into their boot and filled it. Oh, that's awful. You might be able to imagine how bad it is to cast your foot in a lead and burnt boot mixture. For their privacy and to spare everyone from the gore, I'll just say that it was really ugly. The accident was easily avoidable and is a pretty clear example of the Swiss cheese model. This not only highlights why using PPE is important, but also why you need to use the appropriately sized PPE. You also need to know how to appropriately use your PPE and equipment safely. This is a really terrible story, and based on your story, I assume that they made it out of this, but that is absolutely horrifying. Always wear the appropriate PPE, and while it might be a bit of a hazard to find appropriate PPE of the right size, it's worth it. Don't take extra risks because you don't want to spend half an hour finding another piece of equipment. And if you don't have safe PPE, don't do the job. Even if you get told off, it's better to get told off and fired than to get your boot full of molten lead. Oh my gosh. Safety first. The potassium story reminds me of a story that my inorganic professor told us. She used to work in a wastewater treatment facility as a part-time, and they got sodium leftovers to raise the pH of the water. One day, she got a very big chunk of sodium. She tied a rock around it and threw it into the aeration pool. First, it just bubbled underwater, but then the chunk shot up and landed in a nearby forest. <laughs> oh no! Luckily, it had rained recently, so no wildfire started. My grandmother was a dental assistant. Among dental assistants, they had a saying, Bist du des Lebens ho? Trinke Wasser. Bist du des Lebens stier? Trinke Schwefelsäure. If you are happy about your life, drink water. If you are bull about your life, drink sulfuric acid. The gas chromatography olfactometry story reminds me of a job in a pig slaughterhouse. Depending on the animal, the meat can have a stronger smell or taste to it, usually in older males but a stronger taste also means a lower price, so these pigs have to be sorted at one point. So someone's job is to individually smell each and every carcass to send them down a certain path depending on the quality of the meat. This is really interesting, and it's something I've never thought about before. Not a chem incident, but I'll share it anyway. I was studying at a university. There was a clean room with a very expensive piece of technology called nanofab, which, by the way, could produce atom-sized structures. So one day, I worked there with a PhD student, and we started hearing strange noises like boiling water. The noise was becoming louder and louder, and eventually we saw toilet water pouring from a drain in the floor. Not so clean anymore. <laughs> Not so clean anymore. The room was flooded. The water level with fecal masses continued rising for about an hour and reached 10 centimeters or so. Sadly, the nanofab has never worked as before ever since, and the university hasn't spent money to repair it. I guess the moral is, don't ever place your clean rooms above sewer pipes. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't really know how you could have avoided this other than better engineering. This is awful. This is so gross. Carol never wore her safety glasses. Now, she doesn't need to. If you want to hear more stories like this, make sure you subscribe, and I hope you have a great day.